Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories of connection to that which is bigger than us, to the great mystery, to the divine synchronicity of our lives, to the unfolding, to the the moments that bring us closer to that sense of truth and and quiet within us that we know that that's who we are. And uh, I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird. I love uh, to have these conversations to inspire people uh, with other people's stories and to uh, have fascinating discussions around spirituality and awakening and the planet and all of these beautiful um you know, opportunities we have right now to learn and grow. And I also love to guide people on their own journey to find their own purpose and to step into that. So if that's you, if that's you wanting to have that community to grow and to experiment, non-judgmental place to expand into your truth, then uh, look up my website, kerryhummingbird.com. That's K-E-R-R-I, hummingbird.com. And we can uh, talk about Butterfly Circle and reinvent yourself and all that good stuff. So today I have a friend with me, Gina Murphy-Darling. Welcome, Gina. Hi, Carrie. It's great to be here. So this little firecracker, you're going to find out more about in a little bit. So Gina, uh, from the age of about five, Gina's mom called her a troublemaker, but always advised that if she figured out how to, how to do it right, it would serve her well in the world. And so her mom was right. So she is now the disruptor for good. She really likes to stir things up and get people thinking and acting. And she loves to be a ham and make people laugh. So I expect we will have a very good show today. Uh, Gina is really passionate about the earth and is madly in love with the planet. And her big dream is to wake up every single man, woman, and child on this planet to the threat of climate change and then engage them in fun and inspiring ways to be the change they wish to see in the world. And so we are going to be on a journey today of discovery. So Gina, tell us a little bit about your um, awakening to your purpose, your awakening to this big mission, and uh, about you. Tell us a little bit more about you. Well, again, I want to say thank you for having me. And it has been a wonderful journey, and I'm so happy to have the opportunity to share it because I don't know if this happens for a lot of people, but for me, At some point, I realized I was literally in the third third of my life and making the most of it, which I feel I did for most of my life. But my journey for spiritual awakening, for what I was meant to do in the world, that I realized in retrospect I was being prepared for my whole life, was to be a spokesperson for Mother Earth. And it happened in the rainforest in both Peru and Ecuador And I was blessed to go on two amazing trips deep in the jungle, not on a tourist ship with um, bathrooms and air conditioning, but really a trip to the jungle. And to meet with and be um, very present with indigenous people that explained what was at stake with the rainforests. And I felt on the second trip with Ecuador that I had to come back and make my voice even stronger because of what's happening to the, not just the rainforest in, in South America, but to the rainforest all over the world and why they matter so much to the very life we have and to the breaths we take and to the cooling of the oceans. So I had a corporate career for many years and I came back and I said to my husband, I'm going to start a radio show. And we've been married for a really long time. He looked at me and he said, what? We were going to start a radio show. You don't know anything about radio. I said, no, how hard can it be? You just do your homework and ask questions. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have a radio show. And he, I remember what he said to me. He said, well, I've been on Mrs. Toad's wild ride for a long time. So I guess I'll go on this one with you. <laughs> I started a radio show on a, on a terrestrial radio. Um, and I called it Mrs. Green Goes Mainstream. And what if living green could be fun? And I realized after like my 10th or 12th interview that it's really not fun. It's not heavy and dark and deep. It is about consciousness and living consciously and having people really understand the bounty of Mother Earth because Mother Earth, she gives us life, period. And she has finite resources and we're really using them up So that's how it started. And now, you know, you know how things change, Carrie. It was a terrestrial radio show. 
and I had these great guests I'm thinking the bandwidth is like what my county and so I did an internet radio show and then I thought well how many people are listening to a live show at noon on a Saturday and then it evolved into podcasts and that has been without a doubt our most successful impactful and fun platform so that was a long answer but that was that was the journey it was an even longer journey with a lot of ups and downs but it's been really blessed Oh, I'm so curious. What touched you in particular about the indigenous people? You know, I'll never forget it. We were in boats, and I mean, like boats made out of wood from trees in the in the rainforest. And we were going down a tributary of the Amazon River. I was thinking my husband would probably never see me again because how could they find their way back? Because there were no maps. And seeing, and I do get emotional still when I talk about it, the barren land that had been absolutely decimated by either people coming in to mine for oil underneath um, or to clear cut the forest to raise cattle. And they burned the wood. This is really cool wood, like really great wood. And they burned it. And seeing this family that looked like squatters sitting there on this barren land with burned trees. They, you know, it wasn't smoldering, it wasn't that dramatic. And it was raining and watching all of the rain erode the soil. And I'll never forget it. I thought this really sucked, like this is awful. And at that moment I thought, people up north don't know. I call you know, the north, the eagle and the condor, that's a very strong spiritual conversation. But the people in the north, there are lots of us who care and we just have to help with the awakening. And I, can't, I just kept saying, you have to do something, you have to do something. And that was where my mother said, I, oh, she said, you have such a mouth on you, Regina, if you can only use to control it, use it for good. And I did. And she, she became very proud of this mouth I had. Yeah, well, if people haven't been to the jungle, they really haven't. It's hard to it imagine is. it. It's really, it I mean, I've been, but it's hard to imagine it if you haven't been. Right. And to see the deforestation, it's like carnage. And these people probably had been given like $3,000 for their land, which was more money than they ever dreamed of having. But it doesn't support you every day and in the ecuadorian jungle that i went in those people the achuar they live off the land and there's no refrigerator as i said you know what i mean so they have to go fish they have to go look for fruits in the in the jungle there's no storage so every day is a survival day and they live from the bounty of mother earth whatever it is they're eating they hunted or fished and, um, you know, gentle spirits and so respectful and, and aware of the gifts that Mother Earth provides. And, you know, most people in the North think their food comes from Safeway or Smith's or, you know, Kroger's or something. That's not where a lot of all of our food comes from. So it's that connection. Yeah, I, it sounds like you experienced something similar to what I experienced uh, when I went to I've gone to the jungle in Peru, and I've gone to the Sacred Valley in the mountains to the Caro people. And what I witness when I see them is they live really close to the earth. They have these, uh, you know, mud huts that they, uh, you know, little shacks made out of mud bricks. And they, they dress in beautiful rainbow-colored clothing that they hand-knit. And they live like, they'll sit right on the dirt, like right on the earth, which right. is like how we right. would never do, right? Because we don't want to get dirty, right. you know? Like, right. so, <laughs> but they sit right on the grass, and, right, right on, the, on the dirt there. And, and they're really connected in with the animals or right with them. There's no like division. So like the dogs, the cats, the sheep, you know, they're all sort of roaming around, staying kind of pretty much in the same area, but they don't. They don't seem to like sequester, okay, well, you have, you know, these animals have that spot over there and this, this area here is for humans. Like they don't seem to do that. No, no, they are, but. they are one. They are one. I saw so many amazing things. And one of the things that got me, Carrie, is they're, they don't, they don't whisper, but they speak in very low tones. And then you had, you know, us, the ugly Americans that are blah, 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 blah. But we all learned 
to speak softly because of the animals and they hunt. So they're, you know, very low tones, everything, like you said, connected and um, pretty magnificent and so worth preserving. And things are not going well in some of those countries. So it's an everyday challenge. Well, and so how can we explain that to people who have never been and who, whose concept of food is going to the store? You know, this actually, I think our COVID crisis this spring really illuminated for me the precarious position that we're in when we're so dependent on a food chain that delivers food to a grocery store so we can go and buy some. And, and what happens when some group of people get really terrified and like hoard and buy way more than they need and stock their coffers up until like, you know, they, ha they can't fit any more food in their house. And then other people can't get any food because of these people have hoarded to have so much because they're so afraid that there won't be any next week. What happens in our society when we have a lack of food chain supply and we don't have the means to grow our own food? It's kind of scary. Yeah. It is kind of scary. And you hit it. You hit the nail on the head. In the rainforest, there's, it's all about connection and not division and not separation and not walls. Even the tribes, I mean, it kind of blew me away because most of them have cell phones and many of them have been out of the village or they have um, a radio, you know, band with, I forget what you're called, but they know what's going on and they check in. The tribal chiefs check in twice a day to see what um, is happening if there's been heavy rains or if there's been any, you know, disruption or activity. And I agree with you. There's not a sense of connection between us even and our neighbors. And this has helped. I think it has helped. A lot of people are, you know, reaching out and checking on their neighbors, even if it's calling like I did. I, I have friends that are older than I am. I never said to my friend Cindy, do you need me to get you anything from the grocery store? But she has a respiratory disease. So I think it's given a lot of people to, to stop and think. And it you know, kind of cracks me up because when you go on this journey, which I say to people, don't be daunt. It's not daunting. It's one step at a time. And for me, it has been a process that's still in process. I don't live in a yurt with a composting toilet. You know what I mean? I'm still working on it. So I think things like, um, with, like with my family, that, that little step, of connection and, and reaching out to people. So there was all this conversation on TV about meat shortages and because of the meat packing plants. And in not any condescending way, my husband and I looked at each other and said, thank God that we have, or I would say thank goddess, for that we hardly eat any meat. You know, we have chicken and it's organic, it's cage-free, it's all of those things. But we're much less meat based. And that's not a judgment. It's like when you know what's going on, you eat a lot less beef because of the imprint they have on the environment. And it wasn't a sacrifice for us. But for some families that are, you know, burgers and steaks and ribs, it was an adjustment. It's a very expensive habit. Well, it's not only a very expensive habit in terms of money that it costs, but it's the, like you said, the footprint. Like a lot of people don't realize that one of the hugest ways our, our ozone layer is depleted is through all of the, the uh, cattle farms because of the noxious gas emitted from the feces, basically, from the cows, right. the flatulence. Cow farts. That's where my- Cow farts actually destroy cow farts. the ozone. <laughs> like- People don't realize that. So people that they love do. their barbecue, I'm living in Texas, people that just love them some good barbecue are <laughs> contributing to the freaking removal yeah. of the ozone because they want to stuff their faces with barbecue. Yeah. And yep. to me, I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't want to eat that anymore. I, I don't want to eat cow. I don't, I don't, first of all, I don't want to eat cow because I just don't want to eat cow. Right. And, and second of all, I don't want to eat cow because I know the damage that all those, not only just the terrible conditions that, that the cows live in, that is just deplorable. And now you're eating an animal that's been tortured, okay, literally tortured. And you're eating that, you're consuming 
an animal that lives in torture and fear. And right. you're putting the torture and yes. fear in your body and you're calling that yummy. That to me is just, you know, once I woke up, I was like, no wonder people get angry that eat a lot of barbecue. Like no wonder when people eat a lot of barbecue, they end up to be angry people. Like they're really, they contest. And they I love fight that and you're they, saying it. <laughs> I'm just going to say, cause you know, I've, I've witnessed it. You know, when you eat a lot of barbecue or eat a lot of pig, you know, and, and all that stuff, people that do that tend to argue a lot. They tend to just argue a lot. And, and there's, yeah. You know, and get angry and have belligerent. So it's yeah. just sort of something to notice about the, the way that the food impacts you at a consciousness level. You know, when that's what your normal diet is, well, then you end up being reflective of the food that you're allowing into your body. You become reflective of that. And cows that have been tr mistreated this way is just horrible how they've been treated. And they're on the stuff together on those little farms. And when you pass those farms, you roll your windows up and you turn, you know, you hope to God that the smell doesn't come in. Yes. They like, live in that. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. But those cows Quickly. live in that. And then you turn around and eat that cow. You think you're not I ingesting know. that? You're ingesting that. That horrible environment that you can't wait to get past on the, on the, on the Texas road. You're, you're ingesting that when you eat that. It's such a, it's such a <laughs> logical down to earth observation on your part. It's not rocket scientists. It's, it's not. It's super simple. You have to know it's not good. And part of it, which I didn't know either, part of being woke, is that it's because we feed cows things that they're not used to eating, like corn. They should be eating grass, and that cuts down the methane gas significantly because their bodies are not wired for corn. They're wired for grass, and that makes a huge difference. Um, and do you think that you feed the cow... What it's not meant to be eating, you feed it a, a crappy GMO diet, and then you're going to eat that cow, and you think that's somehow healthy and good for you? Because like, it right, doesn't right. make this any sense really good how me. people think. Steak. Like it and carry the antibiotics. When I, it's like when you start going down the rabbit hole. I would I would say to my family and to the people on my team, do you know how many antibiotics that cows are shot with right at, towards the end? It's some ridiculous number, and I, have, I haven't done a show on this for a long time, but like 128. I, I kid you not. Well, that's why... Just shot. I remember when I was raising my kids, they were um, early, preteen, early teen, and I stumbled across the information about the antibiotics and how it was making kids... Um, you know, get boobs quicker and stuff like that. Yeah. And like even the boys like getting boobs because of the antibiotics and all the stuff in the milk. And I've... I, I was told as a young mother, like, feed these kids milk, you know, like milk is healthy, right. whole milk for these right. kids and make them strong. And so I was like, Helps oh, build strong bodies, 12 ways. And oh. I start looking at my kids and they've got boobs. And I was like, oh, you know, so I said, okay, that was around about like fifth grade, I think with my younger son or third, fourth or fifth grade. And I said, I got rid of that information and I said, okay, no more, no more of that. So I think I switched to organic. You know, I switched it. Which is but really it, good because it's hormone free. They put all yeah. the hormones, growth hormones in the cows to help them grow. And why do we think that when we drink it, we don't get those hormones? Do you, there's no filter. There, it's Regina, no they just don't affect us. I mean, we can just, we can put all the crap in that food, but then when we ingest right. it, it's magical. It's just all healthy. Right. It's all clear. <laughs> it's all clear. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot to it. You're right. You're there right. is. And, you know, and then I listened to, to um, Dr. Zach Bush recently. Um, he's been doing a lot of interviews and he's talking about the, the microbiome and he's talking about how um, our, you know, this virus in a way is doing the same thing in nature that nature does with weeds. Weeds in nature are actually to restore the microbiome of the natural environment. It's to restore it after it's been, you know, like mowed down and destroyed. Nature sends these weeds to rebuild the soil and to rebuild the right, biome. Right, and right, then what do right. we do? We bring Roundup. <laughs> oh my God. I know. I know. <laughs> to I mean, get rid of the weeds. They, it, it just, it's unbelievable. And, and then we think we're not eating the, we think we're not eating the Roundup. Roundup. Basically, and you know, one of my obsessions is how sick pets have gotten and the kinds of things they have. And I've done research on it and talked to a lot of vets. And I, I remember about five years ago, I said to a friend of mine, I said, Gene, am I nuts 
Are our dogs getting all kinds of things they never did? He said, I've been in the business 30 years. There's thyroid cancer, there's pancreatic cancer, there's heart disease, there's diabetes. And he said, and what do you think of it? Your diet. And when you get your house sprayed by a chemical pesticide, dogs lick that. There's, there's the treatment on your carpet. So there's the environmental connection that's missing causes a lot of the health problems for us and our four-leggeds. And it's, you know, I try so hard, Carrie, not to sound like judgment and want to sound like passionate, enthusiastic, and have it be contagious. Know what you're doing to your body and your dog's body, and your life will be better. I mean, it's just healthier, happier, like you said. I'm going to use that, like, um, happy people don't eat beef or something <laughs> Well, you know, and I try to do it too without being judgmental. I mean, I didn't start noticing it. I mean, I used to eat, you know, barbecue. I mean, oh my God, I still, I admit it. It's not like I don't like it anymore. (laughs) It's like, I've got a great story. We were shopping. I'm here um, in Taos and my daughter's here with, you know, she said, well, my granddaughter is really why I came. Absolutely true. Um, But I said to her, you know, Em, I just, I'm on vacation I just want to buy some bacon. And she looked at me in a very loving way. She goes, mom, no, you have to go to the other grocery store, the Shishi Fufu grocery store where they have cat, you know, grass fed, ethically raised, never been in pens, never crated. And even for me that I think lives at a pretty high level of consciousness for the environment, bacon is, it, it, it is not a good idea for me, but I love it. So that's what we did. We went and we got it and I read never been created, no antibiotics, mm-hmm. bone free. And it was, I swear to you, I think it was like sixteen dollars. It's super expensive, but that's the price you pay it to is. have it be For better food. That you didn't have to kill yep. it yourself. Yes. Yep. And you I, know, because that's the reality treat. too. Yeah. I think if people had to kill that food for themselves, they wouldn't do it. They would eat vegetables. No, would never. <laughs> if people would never. had to actually kill an animal themselves and eat the I animal, agree. that would I cut would down never. on a whole lot of animal eating because people would at least wouldn't want to do it. I could never. I couldn't do it. And you know, you talk about <laughs> cattle. One of the my favorite guests that I interviewed ever was Temple Grandin. Yes. Stick. And I've met her, and she has my cell phone, and I have her cell phone. She's amazing. She's amazing, but that's what she was so connected to the cows that it literally, she, she was, became undone by the fear of them going into the chute to get the last hurrah. And so she developed this whole circular way of getting the cows there, which most ranchers embraced and loved once they got educated. So you know, there is good news. I still don't want to, the thought of it, like I used to love steak, Carrie, and now the thought of steak. I can't. On that flesh, I can't do it. I really can't. I just, that to me is no longer, I, I actually, along the way, you know, because the awakening journey is in stages, I've noticed. And it so is. It I is. started waking up to this and I started noticing it didn't feel good in my body. And I started noticing, you know, then I would go get it because my family was having a gathering. And so then I would go to the, go to the store and to the, you know, the barbecue place, I won't say which one, and stand in line to order the food. And I'd be standing there and I I would be noticing because I hadn't had this kind of food in a while. And I'd be looking around at the people in the line and I'm kind of noticing like even their features look a little bit like pig-like. Like I start to see and I was like, whoa, like, is this really real? Like did people's features change based on what they're eating. And so it just became this really interesting thing to me to see like are people like are people actually their physical features somehow shifting ever so slightly based on what they eat and I think it's true. So it's just I think you should write another book about that. Well, I am writing I am in the middle of writing another book about mother earth. I know. I want to circle back cuz this this uh this new book is Love is Fear is Healing the Mother Wound. Where we're talking about here is healing the mother wound. The the earth, the mother earth and her wisdom being basically stomped on by human beings, egoic consciousness human beings saying, "I can figure this out better than mother earth." You know, like I totally. can figure out totally. how to do it. And totally. and making like the pharmaceuticals and the the way that we've farmed, you know, everything the the way we've pillaged and raped the earth, you know, these are like, talk about a little bit of that because the jungle, I know you've been to the jungle and the shamans, they work with the people, work with 
the with the jungle, with the animals, with the plants. Like they learn about their environment rather than trying to like say that they can one up it. <laughs> you know? They do live in in harmony. In harmony. Earth and not like their guests because we're not we're part of the whole system, and the awareness of that connection. And I can think of people saw that connection and felt it and changed the world like Jane Goodall. She's one of the people. And I interviewed this other guy that, um, I forget his name, but he wrote the book, Mad Cowboy. And he's the one that worked with Oprah and there was all the controversy in Texas and a big outcry from the Cattlemen's Association. And you know, it's just not hard when you quiet your mind and think. You know, the tagline for the longest time for our show is we don't tell you what to think, we just want you to. And thinking about the consciousness of your actions, because pretty much everything we do has an impact on the planet. Everything we wear, the food we buy, where we shop, how much water we use in the house, how much electricity we use, it has an impact. And it's not, it doesn't have to be heavy. To, I always say to know better is to do better. And most people, I hope, want to do better. So it's, it's, it's in all of our best infra, interest to think of that connection and Mother Earth and all of her bounty. And one of my favorite examples and most painful is fracking. Why do people think it's okay to drill with harsh, harsh chemicals and enormous amount of water and fracture the earth? And then there's nothing to do with that contaminated water afterwards. Nothing. There's nothing that can be done cannot be turned back into potable it's it's done it's toxic forever stored so some of the oil companies and gas companies started putting it into the earth drilling um in oklahoma and you should just google the amount of earthquakes there are in oklahoma now because mother earth said this is killing me enough already and there have been more earthquakes there in the last 10 years than in the in the history of the state so she'll find a way to get our attention, and sometimes it's pretty dramatic, and it doesn't have to be that way. It's, it just well, it's it's kind of sadness. You know, the indigenous people they understand that we live in harmony with the earth, and and the first thing to do is listen to the earth, and that will be provided for. Like everything we need is provided for. That they have a trust and faith that as they listen to the earth and they follow the guidance, that everything's provided for. And, you know, it's this idea of not taking more than you need, only taking what you need. Right. But right. just the right. recent COVID thing really, like I said, demonstrates that that's not the Western mindset. The Western mindset is, I'm going to hoard it all. I'm going to go, like, toilet paper? <laughs> What the hell? Like, where did I mean, that even come from? That was so shocking to me. I was so oh my shocked. God. I did not realize and there was that, no shortage. I didn't realize that's where our consciousness was. That people would be so afraid that they would they would literally hoard all the food and all the toilet paper and everything in their homes out of such great fear of not having enough. And how do those people feel today? You feel okay now? Like you still have toilet paper? I'm sure you can't possibly have used all that. Seriously. If you have used it, I'm very concerned. The American costume. <laughs> you need to see a doctor if you can get if in. If you have used um, all of that toilet paper, we are concerned yeah. for you. We hope that you're okay. And you know another one for me? Um, this is really personal. So we're away for two months out of Arizona, which is the worst state at this point, I think, in the country for COVID in terms of growth. And my husband's high risk, and you know, we wanted to come here anyway because of our little Rooney. But we're not going back to Arizona, to, even for doctor's appointments, because of how bad it is. So here's my confession. I have a lot, a lot of shoes. Because before I was Mrs. Green, more was better, one for every outfit. It's gross now, I think, for me. And my clothes closet. So do you know what I wear now almost every day? I got dressed up for you. I put on a blouse. Thank I wear you. workout clothes every day. Yeah. I wear workout clothes every day. So the truth is, in this COVID world, I could have five nice outfits for dress up when I go to meetings in the aftertimes and five pairs of shoes 
because the third filthiest industry and most harmful, especially to women and children, is the fashion industry. Hmm. Used to buy, I was like the grandma from heaven. It's Valentine's Day. Everybody's getting a Valentine shirt from Target. It's St. Patrick's Day. Everybody's getting a, val- a St. Patrick's Day shirt for $5. So my grandchildren are pretty funny, my older grandchildren. When I found out the manufacturing process, and I'm not picking on Target because they're trying very hard to change the supply chain and the you know fair trade and the working conditions. Now when I do that, and I very rarely go to Target because I'm not consuming as much, I say to my grandchildren, remember when I used to buy those? Now I know they have the blood of children on them. And people will be listening to this, and my, my granddaughter will go, Grandma, seriously, can you just, like, these people think you're nuts. But it's not an exaggeration. Mm-hmm. You're getting a nice quality cotton T-shirt for $5. There was not a fair wage page for that. No, so, there wasn't, because Target had to make their, prof- their profit. Yes, and, and they had, had to, to make shipped. And the shipping yep. and everything, yeah. And all that stuff. So it's just, and like, and I said this earlier, and I have to say it again, it's not like, oh my God, I can't buy my shirt at Target. It's like, I don't really need a shirt that I'm going to wear one day a year. What's, what the heck? Like, that's the consumer mindset of, like you said, more is better. So in every area of our life, I did a YouTube video once about, like, when you wipe, and I'll say that because that's where my humor comes in, do you need this much toilet paper or can you get by like on five little sheets or three or how many, how much do you use? Because people don't think about and paper towels and tissues. Well, even when we go to the jungle, like with my very conscious group, we still have to remind people, yes. don't use so much toilet paper and don't put it down you don't need the it. toilet because the jungle can't handle it down the can't toilet. So yes. put and it we in don't the bucket. <laughs> yes, I know. I mean, it's like... But people are so trained with, with like wads itself. and wads and wads and wads and wads and wads of toilet paper it's for like ridiculous. one little tiny bit of poo-poo. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> exactly we're, so, right. we're so scared of our feces. You know, we're so scared of it's anything ridiculous. dirty that looks like it's a bodily function right. or looks right. animalistic or smells. Like we're so like anathema to actually being in a human body it's crazy in our Western society. We've done everything to remove ourselves from nature so we don't have to face our natural element. Or think and about it. It's crazy. Just don't even think about it. There's no connection. And it's, you know, I always say it's an invitation. And I know I got into this conversation with a friend of mine one day who's a rabid environmentalist. She works at the U of A. And we were talking about straws. And she said, you know, Gina, it's ridiculous that you even make straws an issue. Because if everybody in the world stopped using straws tomorrow, we'd still have big problems with climate change. And I said to her, I said, you know, Nance, to me, start somewhere. Yes, straws are a gateway to consciousness because straws are water intensive, packaging intensive, shipping intensive, and I'm talking about plastic straws, and they have to be recycled and they're not. So it's one thing that most people are able to give up and then they start thinking well i wonder else what else i can cut down i was that person well and actually it's an innovation opportunity because they've now made those straws that are um, biodegradable that are plant-based which so you can have your straw it's fine like we're you not have your straw that. and eat it too we're <laughs> saying have the straw in a way that's sensitive to the ecology it's sort of like also i saw somebody came up with um um, algae uh, made uh, rings like for um, bo- beer cans like yes. have yep. your beer have your beer thing but not with the plastic have it with the algae thing so that it biodegrades if and when it gets you don't have to eat. worry about it it's just fine yeah. it's food it's fish food like they'll, they'll actually eat it and be okay you know so and the same with tin cans like i know we have another solution for that we don't need to make tin cans okay we don't need any more tin cans we don't need any more plastic bottles like we can actually Oops. we're savvy enough we can create opportunities but it, i think it comes from we've got to be humble we've got to be humble and understand like dr zach bush is understanding our microbiome we've got to understand the earth's microbiome we've got to understand how we fit into it so right. when we create something right. we're listening to her to create it we're not just going well i can create this cool thing and like i can create you know these pills and solve this 
you know, symptom, but then we don't get down to the root cause. And then the thing that we just created creates another gap, another problem. And now we've got to have another pill for that. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, it's like, and to your point, plastic bottles is another one. First of all, they're really bad for you. And I, that can be proven if you're into science, which I happen to be. I, I think science is kind of a good thing of what chemicals leach from plastic bottles. And people say to me often, but organic is so expensive. It's so expensive, which isn't always the case. It usually is. But it's about how do you design your budget? Because if you're buying four cases of water bottles every two weeks, you can buy a lot of kale for what that costs, organic kale. So it's looking at it. And, and these are things that I, are, that I call them lessons from the heart because that's what I looked at. It's like, what am I spending my money on? And, you know, fortunately I have daughters that won't compromise for their children on what has to be organic and what doesn't because everything doesn't have to be organic when it comes to vegetables. But it's what am I ingesting in my body that's coming in through the food that I'm eating. So it's, you know, like I said, it doesn't feel heavy. It's like an invitation to health and awareness and everybody wins. And it's an invitation to empowerment. Like for the, for even like the plastic yes. water bottles thing, like you can have glass bottles, you can have reusable glass bottles and you can um, get a water filtration system in your house that actually One gives time. you the most pure water you could ever want. Like right. my husband's a super genius. And so he got us a really beautiful, you know, water filtration system that we fill up all of our water bottles with. And it's, it's delicious water. You, you know, I like to take my water bottle to the park just as much as anybody else. And right, I'm filling right. it up at home with beautiful water that is pure, clean. pristine, and clean. Right. And you can test it. You can get a little tester kit, and you can make sure it's clean. So, like, isn't that great? You can learn how to do that for yourself. Right. No arsenic, no Ambien. No, no. There's a lot of really nasty things in a lot of our water. So it's just, it just can No fluoride. <laughs> over a fluoride. I, mean, I don't like them shutting down my pineal gland personally. I like to have that <laughs> activated. So thank you yeah, very much, too. government. You want me to have my, my fluoride and my water to, sh to shut off my connection to spirit. Yeah. No, thank you. No, I'll take <laughs> care drink of my, my, water. my water without fluoride. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> So, well, people can learn a lot. So how do people learn a lot from you? Like uh, listening to your podcast, you have places, you have articles that you share about um, all of this wisdom that you've been collecting yeah. about how we can show up better. I think my website is a treasure trove because of the team of all of us that help put it together. There are hundreds of podcasts pretty much on anything you want to know, including green burials, so soup to nuts, and not just about um, climate change and living a more sustainable life. We are very, very much moving in the direction of you cannot have a sustainable planet without a socially just one. So we're doing a lot more on the social justice piece, which is inherent, it's just inextricably bound to climate change because of the impact it has on marginalized communities. They suffer the most, so we're doing a lot of that. And we blog, there's, there's any blog, that you, any subject you ever thought on green, it's on there, and if it isn't, send an email to me, Gina at Mrs. Green's World, and we'll cover it, but it's, it's, you know, people have said you need to specialize. And I say to them, I have. I'm committed to planet Earth because putting things in silos, it's not just about solar or clean water or vegetables or the rainforest. It's about the planet. And you can show up every day, every day, and make a difference. And that's what we, we don't preach. We get excited about. We share we blog, we Facebook, we treat, tweet, we Instagram. And, um, you know, it's been a really blessed journey. And you know that. You, Carrie, Hummingbird, know that. Because when you say yes, things just keep happening. Opening, 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 and continue to open. So here I am. I'm going to be 70 in December, and I'm going strong. And new things keep coming up that are engaging me in new and challenging ways. It's a great time to be doing this work yeah it's uh it's powerful to stay on the on connected you know i want to say yes. that that the number one thing i believe people can do if they're really if you, you know if you're out there and you're like gosh where do i get started now i feel like i'm missing out and i really am being um you know unconscious with my food choices and such you know here's the thing to do 
is to go outside in nature, preferably someplace that doesn't have, for, uh, you know, Roundup on the ground. So <laughs> like, we, we don't, we don't. Good use point. Anything. I sit out on my front lawn all the time because I don't, I don't do that to my lawn. So I, I want to say that's why I sit on my lawn. So I sit on my front lawn and I meditate. And I connect in with Pachamama and I open sacred space and I sit and meditate and let, let's just take it one issue at a time. So if you're concerned about the water you're drinking, sit and meditate, open, yep. listen for the answer, open for a Perfect. solution, wait for what yep. comes in and then follow the synchronicities that lead you to the answer. You know, so take every single thing like that and it takes a while to get through all the decisions it does. It does. <laughs> Look, a it, lifetime. But it's going to be a lifetime. It is a lifetime, but you can take care of your patterns today. Like there's a list of patterns that you have, and it seems overwhelming at first. But if you just start with one thing at a time that captures your attention, like what's the biggest impact I could make? Take that one decision, sit and meditate on that, get the, get the steps, and then get that nice and sorted out in your life so that's your new thing. And once that's sorted, open for the next thing and just take it one at a time, right? Gina, just such good advice. And the thing is, I try to couch it in instead of eating less meat, then there's the mindset of less and deprivation and lack. It's like eat more legumes, eat more greens and make it a really positive thing. Like I lentils are my new best friend and eat vegetarian chili. What can I do? And the same thing with water bottles. I get to use my swell reusable bottle every day and it keeps water cold for 12 hours. So it's like, what opportunities are there instead of lack? There are so many things, you know, that I'm, I am nuts about like running, keeping the water running and not being aware that, you know, some people don't have clean water and paper towels. You know, we used to go from a case a month to a roll a month because sometimes a paper towel comes in handy. But you don't need four to wrap up, to wipe up a spot. You know this. So right. you can it's use a cloth. Great opportunity. You can use a cloth and one dry and wash it. it, and then it's okay tomorrow. So there's things that just been an exciting opportunity of changes. Oh, that's right. I changed to LED light bulbs, and my electricity bill went down. Not significantly. It wasn't like fifty dollars a month, but it went down because they don't generate as much heat, their lighting is great, and they last for freaking ever. You know what I mean? So there's, there's wonderful opportunity if you live a more sustainable and socially just life. It's happier. It's happier, and you're giving your money to things that are, are um, conscious, and as you make each one of those choices, you feel better about yourself. Because you're not really, you ignoring do. something that's really awful and continuing to do it because of habit. And addiction. And that joy is contagious. It is. It makes you feel better. Like, I don't, I haven't had beef in a really long time. Look how much I glow. Like, check it out. <laughs> I feel I great. Look at our sense of humor. I'm more healthy than I've, I've ever been. Really I'm 50. I, I know. feel great. I know. So I don't eat Every that once stuff. in a while, I do sneak to my favorite fast food <laughs> place with, in a disguise and um, have, you know, this is in the mustache and the hat because I'm Mrs. Green in my town. So it's, it's not all or nothing. There's guilty pleasures that you can sneak hey, in. Hey, they have burgers that are made from veggies, and they're delicious. Yes, and they, they are. They even have bean burgers. Like, I've had they bean are. burgers. They're made out of bean and beet and all kinds of stuff. They taste great. So there's alternatives. You can still have a burger. You just don't have it right. that right. way. And it looks like meat. It's all red and everything, and it looks all, you know, but it's not. Yeah. It's yeah. meat. Yeah. And I love writing and reading and interviewing people about those things, and it's all – there's a lot on my website. It's when we switched to get our website modern and re totally redid it, we used this wonderful company and they looked at us in the first meeting and they said, boy, you have a lot of content. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. There's a, lot. a lot of people that have websites are starving for content. Well, we've got a lot of content. We have a good search bar and we love to answer people's questions if it isn't there. Awesome. Well, it sounds like a wonderful resource. I'll put a link to the sh uh, to your website in the show notes so people Thanks. can check it out into your podcast. And uh, yeah, so well, thank you so much for coming Jerry, on. Thank and you. This was so much fun and it went so fast. That's when you, um, time does fly when you're having fun. And when the link is up, tell me and we'll put it out on the World Wide Web as well and our social media platforms. It's been so much fun.
Thank you so much. And, and so everybody, if you really enjoyed this broadcast and you thought, you know, wish I, I want to share that message out with my family and I'm not the one saying it, we'll let Carrie Hummingbird say it. <laughs> it's okay. You can use me that way. It's fine. Right, I'm fine. Right, right. You know, go ahead and share it out. And, uh, but be sure to put a nice comment um, and a review on iTunes and YouTube, wherever you find it, because that's what helps those engines to know that this content yes. is valuable, is engagement. So if you share it from there or you, you share those links or you give us a five-star review there or a comment, that's how they know that this is uh, valuable content to listeners. So please do that. And then I'm going to give you guys kisses on the way out. Want to join me, Gina? I always give people kisses on the way out. Yeah, yeah. Hey, my granddaughter. Mwah. Mwah. I love that. I'll show my granddaughter. and She does like this. We love you, humans. We love you beef-eating humans. That's right. <laughs> we, we love, love all, all of God's you. children. I know. This was great, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait to see you in the after times Absolutely. in person. Have a beautiful okay. day, everybody. See you next time on Soul Nectar Show. Bye for now. Thank you.